I was hoping you were going to do the introduction from the uh, from the Facebook event where it talks about what are the words knowledgeable, charismatic, and riveting. Which is and and I wrote on there you forgot humble. So uh, extremely humble. My yeah, but uh, so yeah. Let me share screen here. And then we'll jump right into this. You, you mentioned the esoterica. I'm definitely into Western esotericism and where that kind of intersects with Freemasonry and other, uh, you know, um, domains within Western esotericism. But I'll tell you what, I don't want to disappoint you, but we're, we're on the trivium tonight. So it's like, you know, there might be some, there, there actually are some of the places where, where you'll find, um, we venture into those uh, more philosophical kind of, of course, in logic, but I mean more uh, occulty sort of esoteric philosophy, but uh, not too much in this presentation. However, uh, a, a quick plug, um, I do have a, uh, here, I'm gonna show you real quick. I'm gonna, right before I start my presentation, I just wanna share a screen so I could show you guys something. All right. No, no screenshots, please, because uh, where is it? But here's a sneak peek on 624. I should be telling you this at the end, but I'll tell you now. On 624, uh, this is coming out. This is my follow-up uh, book. Don't look too long. You're looking too long. Hold on. Okay, so. That's 624. Talk about esoteric stuff. I picked St. John the Baptist Day, which is in the vicinity of the uh, summer solstice, of course. And 624 is a Wednesday. And if you know um, uh, your planetary deities, that's uh, Wednos, that's Woden, that's uh, Mercury and Hermes. And since I read a lot about Hermeticism, I figured I'd do it on a Wednesday. Anyway, so here's this presentation. Let's just get into this. You still hear me loud and clear? Everything good? Am I good? Great. Okay, here's the trivium. Uh, so the trivium is constituted of the, the basic units of learning. So that's how to absorb literature and, and oration. Um, most importantly, how to form, write, and communicate coherent thoughts. And that right there kind of says all of what we're talking about, to form and to write and communicate coherent thoughts. So forming thoughts, of course, that involves logic, right? Um, writing and orating involves uh, grammar and rhetoric, uh, communicating coherent thoughts. The, uh, the, the, the idea of coherency um, implies logic, that there, that there must be a, a sort of sound reasoning behind uh, what you are communicating. How, the body of, of how you communicate that being rhetoric and uh, sort of, you know, writing it and speaking, of course, involve grammar. So... It, this, these, uh, the trivium sort of aids us in effectively digesting literature uh, for a capacity for critical thought, uh, the ability per to persuade through discourse, the ability to recognize and circumvent logical fallacies, and the ability to compose compelling arguments and hypotheses. Um, so, Historically, the student was prepared to move on after, after going through the trivium and establishing these uh, basic units of learning, like we said. Uh, they would move on to the quadrivial su subjects or the, uh, the physical arts, um, and which uh, Joe Martinez does a really good talk about. I, I recommend his quadrivium talk. So the, the trivium, uh, as the name implies, trivium, the, the prefix tri, right, for three, like tricycle or triple, or, and, and uh, vium, as in way, vium, uh, like via, uh, 
via de via de ventura you know or it's like a road or a, a way or a lane so these are the three roads or the three ways and they're also um known as the artes sur mocking i'm going to butcher some of this latin artes sur machinales artes sur machinales um and those consisted of, of course, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And logic sometimes referred to as uh, dialectic. We'll get into that a little more later. So the seven liberal arts appeared in something like their canonical form that we're familiar with in the early fifth century in the work of this guy, um, Martianus Capella. And uh, he wrote a book that was called De Noptius Philologiae et Mercurii. So that translates into On the Marriage of Mercury and Philology. And uh, it was, you know, books around that time had, uh, you know, and all the way through the Renaissance had like tremendous um, subtitles that were like a paragraph long. Um, this one may have as well, but people ended up calling it De Septum Disciplinis. De Septum Disciplinis, the seven disciplines. And, uh, you know, squarely on the seven liberal arts and sciences. In, again, something like the form that, that we have them in Freemasonry. So let's get straight into grammar. This is from Preston. There may be some Oliver thrown in there as well. Grammar teaches the proper arrangement of words according to the idiom or dialect of any particular people and enables us to speak or write a language with accuracy, agreeably to reason and correct usage. So that's how we get it in, in Freemasonry. Uh, grammar, uh, which actually comes from uh, grammar or letter from the Greek. It's a set of rules underlying the use of language. So when we say that, we're talking about things like uh, syntax and morphology. Uh, syntax being, how would I put this? Syntax is like the structure of a sentence or the, you know, the, the, uh, the ordering of uh, subjects and predicates and verbs and nouns and the nuts and bolts of uh, we're not going to be talking about that stuff there's just not if you're an English speaker or even if you're English as a second language if you're listening to me right now you're sufficiently advanced in uh, English grammar more than likely so there's no need for us to really get into them and plus this isn't some you know like an instructional course but uh, morphology is another aspect of uh, grammar and language. And morphology is uh, essentially the study of forms. Um, so, you know, how, how words are formed and we can get into etymology and things like that. Uh, what, so grammar falls under the broader purview of linguistics. That's kind of what we would call it today. It's, it's a broader sort of rubric, but, it, but that's where we'll find grammar most of the time. And it's defined as the study of human speech, including the units, nature, structure, and modification of language. So here it just says basically syntax and morphology. Um, by that very definition. So grammar does not include spelling and punctuation. Um, so next time you go to um, angrily respond to somebody's uh, Facebook comment, um, nice grammar, dude, when they spell something wrong, you're actually talking about orthology, ortho, ortho, sorry, orthography. So orthography is that domain that deals with spelling and punctuation. So as we said, native speakers of any language are endowed with the grammar or rules of their particular language, as these are largely acquired without explicit instruction. Um, 
So it's just like, you know, uh, Rosetta Stone or one of those programs. When you're, when you're a kid and you have a lot of neuroplasticity, you know, and you're dealing with your parents and they hand you a bottle and they say bottle, uh, you know, things that anybody who has a kid can probably say, I do not actually, but I deal with dogs and birds a lot. Probably not too much different. They say the parrots are like a perpetual two-year-old. So I got like a bunch of parrots. Anyway, all right. So um, the art of grammar is foundational to any further study as it's contingent subjects such as rhetoric or logic and logic are predicated on a thorough grasp of its rules. So the composition of concise and impactful expressions in letters, words, and speech is indispensable if one wishes to participate in either private or public discourse in any meaningful way. Now in Freemasonry particularly, grammar is the underlying basis of our lectures and ritualism. Um, not to mention grammar's centrality apropos the immense body of supplementary literature, which forms such a large part of our search for further light. Um, but even beyond this, and this is kind of my favorite part of grammar, is how it's not just to do with um, verbs and predicates and nouns and sentences and syntax and morphology in, in, the, in the verbal or literary sense. Uh, grammar is also, uh, there can be a grammar of architecture. We're looking at it now. So you see these order, these five orders of architecture here, and um, they're, each of them have, they're, are replete sort of with their own grammar. Um, and uh, they're, they're bound by certain rules of harmony, symmetry, ratio, proportion. And there can be grammars of music uh, and grammars of, uh, somebody brought up astrology. And uh, I like when people bring up astrology and astrology has a grammar. I don't know if any of you are into that, but it, when, you, when you look at uh, planets in signs and in houses and how they aspect each other, how the angles at which they, they meet, it's, it's at once a grammar, a planetary sort of zodiacal grammar as much as it is an algebra. Um, which that's something I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that later. Um, I think there's something to grammar and algebra. This is just popping into my mind now, so don't. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that down. Grammar and algebra. There's something to the way that they kind of fit together. In algebra, you have the uh, you have exponents and terms and PEMDAS, if anybody remembers PEMDAS, orders of operations, that's parentheses, exponents, uh, multiplication, division, um, PEMDAS, addition, subtraction. So you've got the operations and their order, uh, which is a syntax, right? And then there's a morphology because when you put an algebraic expression together and you solve it, or you solve for x or whatever the unknown or the variable is, you're, you're, that's a morphology because then it becomes, that algebraic expression becomes uh, the sum. They're, they're uh, equated in the equation. Anyway, a digression. Um, let's talk about Dionysius Thrax. I know you wanted to start talking about this guy. He's right there on the left that colorful sort of mosaic. And uh, that's the earliest known, he wrote the earliest known Greek work on grammar called The Art of Grammar. Uh, that was around 100 BCE. Uh, he was a student of the guy on the right, that's Aristarchus of Samothrace. Not to be confused with, I believe it was another Aristarchus of Rhodes. Aristarchus of Rhodes was a, uh, a different guy, and he was the one who came up with, uh, he had a heliocentric model, um, a thousand, no, more than a thousand, 1300 years before uh, Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo and people like that. So 
Yeah, he's a good one to look into. But this is the different Aristarchus. This is Aristarchus of Samothrace. Um, and uh, Dionysius Thrax learned a lot from him. Works on Latin grammar. So we were talking about Greek grammar and the art of grammar by Thrax. Works on Latin grammar began to emerge near the beginning of the first millennium of the Common Era, uh, most notably in the work, oh my God, there we go, in the work of Lucius Orbilius Pupillus. Lucius Orbilius Pupillus. That, he was, uh, that was the, uh, yeah, right into the uh, first, first century of the common era. And then uh, another guy, the guy on the right, Remius Palaemon. So they were the, grit, the big uh, grammarians, early Latin grammarians. And look, this guy even, you know, I don't know what cathedral that's off. I should have written that down. I'm normally better about citing stuff like this, but uh, um, maybe it's Sharp. I know they did a lot of work with the uh, seven liberal arts and sciences at Sharp in France. Latin grammar as taught in the trivium was largely influenced by the uh, Priscianus Caesariensis. Priscianus Caesariensis, that he wrote the Institutes of Grammar in 500 uh, CE. And that work, uh, that work was produced in late antiquity and became canonical in the liberal arts programs of the Middle Ages. And that's where we see it really start to blossom in the Middle Ages. But we're going to move on to rhetoric. Rhetoric teaches us to speak copiously and fluently on any subject, not merely with propriety, but with all the advantages of force and elegance, wisely contrive, contriving to captivate the hearer by strength of argument and beauty of expression, whether it be to entreat or exhort, to admonish or applaud. Preston. Maybe some Oliver in there. Illustrations. Rhetoric is the theory and practice of persuasion, and it can be performed in spoken or written uh, discourse. And by it, uh, one tries to uh, influence or motivate one's listener or reader. The art of rhetoric is the structure and sequence of uh, the speech or text. The art of rhetoric is the structure and sequence of the speech or text, and it should comprise a suit suitable vehicle for the substance of a central argu argument or proposition. So wait, let me kind of unpack that for a second. Um, a suitable vehicle, that, that the rhetorical approach is contingent or predicated on the subject matter. So if we're talking about, uh, well, let's say like, like the news, uh, a news, I'm gonna do a bad imitation of a newscaster or a news anchor. Uh, the art of rhetoric is the structure and sequence of the speech. You know how they talk, they have a certain cadence, right? So they're taught to have this certain cadence because of the material, because they want it to be just a straight up Midwestern kind of, kind of enough of a inflection to get you interested or to, or to keep you involved in it. But in broadcasting school or in radio, they must definitely teach these people uh, how to, um, you know, I'm, I know that they've uh, capitalized on the science of rhetoric in that sense. So next time you're watching the news, um, check out how their inflections are kind of uh, giving form to the content uh, of what they're talking about. And I don't mean that in a loaded political kind of way. I'm not necessarily saying that, though that is certainly the case sometimes. Um, another way would be like in the church. Um, you know, uh, we go, uh, my wife and I, we go to uh, Greek Orthodox Church. I don't care who knows it. We go to Greek Orthodox Church. And um, they're always like, 
The art of rhetoric is in the structure and sequence of the speech. You know, they've got these certain ways that they do that. And that's just a rhetorical thing. They've been doing it for thousands of years, literally a couple thousand years. Well, I don't know how long they've been doing that rhetorical thing, but a long time. I think that 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 sort of delivery probably goes back to the Middle Ages, actually, or the Byzantines, because uh, in the Eastern Church, that is the Greek Church, Constantinople, uh, and and it probably has a lot to do with chant, right? Sort of Gregorian chant or any sort of chant from around that time. Did they have it, ever have Benedictine chant? Well, they had uh, Hildegard von Bingen, von Bingen. You ever hear any of her stuff? I know you can't really answer me. You're on mute right now. But uh, Hildegard von Bingen, there's somebody to check out. She was a theosophist. So I will get into, I will get into some uh, esoteric stuff. She, had, she was a, a revelatory um, polymath, you would call her. A polymath being like a multidisciplinary approach to uh, she was just into so much uh, interesting stuff, and and her overarching thing, of course, was her her theological frame of reference and her theosophy, which wasn't even called theosophy, I don't think, at the time. But uh, she was an interesting lady. Um, so that's what I mean by a suitable vehicle for the substance of a central argument or proposition. You know how we say these things. Uh, you've heard the expression, it's not uh, what you say, it's how you say it. That's rhetoric in a nutshell, right? It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, uh, Johnny, you really did a piss poor job doing the dishes or whatever, you know, when you could be, you've really got a great opportunity there to do the dishes better next time, you know, or whatever. You, I'm sure you can think of your own examples. But uh, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And how you say it is rhetorically, you know? How you say it is considered rhetorically. That's the art. Um, in more recent times, oh wait, another digression, if, if you'll uh, let me. Um, art, so we talk about the liberal arts and sciences, something I've been thinking uh, about lately or over the course of writing that last manuscript was, Okay, then what's an art and what's a science? What am I calling an art and what am I calling it? Is, is astronomy an art? And I came up with something, uh, it, or is it a science, right? Is geometry an art when we're dealing with a pretty reductionist kind of rigid thing? Is it, can, can we consider it an art, the art of geometry? Are we really creating with it or are we just noticing it in, out in the world, you know? Um, and using that to quantify and qualify our uh, experiences of events and phenomena and space and time, right? Uh, but, and sorry, I'm dipping into the quadrivium right now. But the difference, but let's get back to the trivium. The difference between a science and an art, is logic a science or is it an art? Is rhetoric, I would certainly call an art, right? So to me, and this is just to me, and I haven't uh, necessarily written this down anywhere, but I was thinking, okay, if there's interpretation involved, if there is um, improvisation and interpretation involved, I would call that an art. Some sciences can be expressed artistically, um, but science to me is a little more empirical. It is a little more sort of rigid in its, um, parameters of interpretation and its parameters of expression. You know, some things can be reduced to such a point to where there's one great way to E equals MC squared or something like that, to use a trite example. But uh, I don't know, that's something, you know, I'm just kicking that up for you to think about. What, what's the, we say the seven liberal arts and sciences, but what's an art and what's a science? What's the difference? Are they all arts and sciences? I don't know. I kind of came up with something I'm comfortable with for now, but I'm flexible enough to where if a better idea comes along, I'll, I'll take that one too. Um, anyway, so let's get into the history of rhetoric. Uh, though there exist Mesopotamian and Egyptian works on the subject, rhetoric 
uh, was formally taught and practiced in the time of the ancient Greeks until the middle of the 19th century, we were teaching rhetoric, uh, and was considered an indispensable component in the curricula and training of orators, counselors, statesmen, lawyers, historians, and poets. And I think we can notice that. If you go back a couple hundred years, people just spoke differently. People wrote letters differently. I'm in the middle of reading, here's a little esoterica. I'm in the middle of reading, what is the title? The Magicians of the Golden Dawn. And it's got a bunch of their letters from the 1890s in there. And if somebody wrote me a letter like that today, or even an email or a text, I would be like, wow, good job. Nice effort, you know? Um, Law, I would probably write that. No, I'm kidding. But uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. And, you know, that makes me think, you know, I was joking by saying lol, you know, we say things like lol, these things enter the lexicon. Um, and uh, it's funny how, um, like, uh, it's funny how there's this epigenetic sort of uh, give and take with our environment, not only biologically, you know, about epigenetics is the organism in its environment and how there's a mutual exchange, a reciprocal evolution between the environment and the organism. It's a, really a hermetic micro-macro relationship. It's the same thing, the microcosm resonating with the macrocosm, and that's the organism in its environment. You know, And that's what scientists today call epigenetics, biologists call epigenetics, right? But there is, an, there is also a um, epi, let's make up a word, an epiphonetics let's say, epiphonetics, or an epi, um, epi-orthographics or something. Yeah, you would say epi-orthographics if you're using, uh, if there's a relationship between the, the um, computer speak, you know, low, um, LMFAO, et cetera. Um, you know, some people just say LMFAO now. It doesn't even, it's not even an acronym anymore. It's just a thing, like, well, anyway. Okay, so, um, in ancient Greece, as today, rhetoric was used to, to sway political opinion, and consequently, public oration on matters political was a common practice in the polis, as well as its courts and assemblies. The sophists, now, um, we think of that, that's like a bad word today, sophistry, right? And it kind of should be, but uh, it's definitely got a negative connotation. They were the first to codify and instruct others in the art of rhetoric and were very active in the political sphere, but they were sort of the mercenaries of um, politicizing. You know, they were the guys who, th you would hire them um, to really construct the most, uh, um, persuasive kind of argument to your point, right? They were spin doctors, what we call spin doctors today, or, or, or people who spin the news. They were just very biased. They were financially motivated. Um, they, you know, it's weird. I'm thinking about it now, and it's like um, sophistry has really won, you know? It's really so... Um, so blatant and so brazen. Uh, Pre-Socratic sophist Gorgias, that's the guy on the left, uh, he was keen to widen the field of rhetorical discourse and he even famously applied it to the Homeric epics uh, where he was trying to uh, prove the innocence of Helen of Troy as a challenge to himself. Um, which I don't think is actually very hard thinking about it now, because what did Helen do? She was the face that launched a thousand ships, they say, right? Um, but I don't think it was her bad, what was it, Paris? Um, the guy, Paris, uh, ended up with her. I think he won her as some, I think he won her as a prize. She might have even been a slave of some kind. I, I forget kind of the story, but I don't know that it was her fault that she, uh, Anyway, I'm not going to make Gorgias's argument for him. There's probably a place we can go and read that. Let's get into somebody we all 
know and love, and that's Plato, the guy on the uh, left there. He was critical of the Sophists, particularly Gorgias, who he argued who he argued he argued that Gorgias was doing a deliberate disservice to truth in the practice of his deceptive oratorical gymnastics. Hence the negative connotation of the word sophistry, which is defined as quote, subtly deceptive reasoning or argumentation, unquote. Aristotle, Aristotle, the guy on the right there, kind of the successor of Plato, you know that, uh, tried to resuscitate the reputation of the art of rhetoric, which had suffered abuse by the sophists and Plato. Um, he did this by narrowing its focus and classifying various genres of rhetoric. And these three genres were deliberative, that is to say political, forensic, which is to say judicial, and epidiectic, epidiectic. So that would be ceremonial. That would be like toast, toastmasters um, are, are epidiectic. Actually, we're epidi Masons are epidiectic in their uh, rhetorical approach in, um, in not only in ritual, but certainly as any other brother have anything to bring before this lodge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, you don't wanna go up there and just say something stupid. You know, or when you're when the uh, when the chaplain is offering a prayer, you know, I know some chaplains who improvise prayers that are dope. I mean, they're good. They're really good at uh, um, just extempor extemporaneously kind of generating a prayer based on the moment and phenomena and events that have happened like that day and are happening around that time, and weaving people and their lives into it. That's rhetoric. That's a great example of rhetoric. Uh, the chaplain, any chaplain who extemporaneously uh, offers prayer is, uh, and does a good job at it. So there are three distinctions that were made regarding the forms of rhetorical oration. Am I getting loud? Am I getting hella loud right now? Matt, I could see you, no? No, you're fine. All right, good, all right. Um, these three distinctions, which you're probably familiar with, these are known, known, as, known as the modes of persuasion or alternately the rhetorical appeals. These are ethos, pathos, and logos. And uh, they were, I believe, first found in Aristotle's rhetoric. He had a book called Rhetoric from the fourth century BCE. Um, so briefly, ethos referred to how authoritative, authoritatively the orator displayed mastery of the subject at, at hand. Kind of like what I'm doing now with, uh, this is that humility that I was, no, I'm kidding. Again, I, I kid, I make jokes, okay. Um, ethos, uh, how, authoritative, how authoritatively the orator displayed mastery of the subject at hand. This was achieved by being fluent in the technical vernacular of the subject and involved a demonstration that the orator was indeed qualified in the given field. Ethos is practiced today in the form of the presenter's professional and academic credentials, as well as in the citation of the source documents of other authorities. Pathos, pathos, uh, involved appealing to the emotions of the audience. The words sympathy, empathy, and pathetic are derived from pathos, pathos. Um, it, was, it was best achieved by inspiring an emotional resonance with the audience through value judgments and conveying a sense of justice, such as arguing that a certain perspective or position feels right, you know? So, um, I'm not gonna dig too deep on that one because that's a sore spot for, I don't care whose side you're on or if you're in the middle or whatever. I mean, it's, it's inescapable that we see pathos, um, the rhetorical device of pathos, this mode of pathos being so, um, God, just overused, you know? Not everything needs to be, um, I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not making any political commentary. I'm just saying pathos as an, as a mode in argumentation is overused. Let me leave it at that. 
Logos, from whence we get the word logic, is the appeal to reason in which facts and figures are used to support the orator's thesis. However, unsupported, miscontextualized, or falsified data may be presented in an effort to confuse or mislead the audience. I wrote this a while ago, and it's like um, kind of apropos, right? These, these three modes. We really got to learn these things, right? We really got to learn these if we're going to watch the news and be on Facebook or or talk to people at work or anything. We have to we have to know ethos, pathos, and logos. We have to know rhetoric. We have to know sophistry. It just behooves us to do that. I'm going to skip a little section here because it's boring. Let me see. Uh, it, I'm just talking about the rhetoricum, the rhetorica ad hermenium. It was Cicero or Cicero. I think I would say Cicero. Um, you've read the name Cicero before, right? If it's Latin, though, aren't all the C's hard? I say Paracelsus. A lot of people say Paracelsus. I always say Paracelsus. So I'm going to start saying Cicero. Um, maybe you can join me and we can make a change one person at a time saying Cicero instead of Cicero. Um, oh, this is good. Quintilian. So he's the guy who, who probably actually wrote that, that was attributed to Cicero. Um, he was a Roman orator and rhetorician. Um, he codified the five canons of oration. These are good for Masons too. There's a good part in here. Um, institutio, um, no, that was, that was not one of the things. That was the, one of the books he wrote this in. Uh, there was invention, inventio. There was arrangement, dispositio, like disposition. There was style, elocutio. There was memory, memoria. And there was delivery, actio, as in action, um, the delivery of it. Um, so obviously memory, delivery, uh, the invention, the arrangement, and the style, Masonically, those were given to us largely by uh, Preston, right? Preston and his commentators, for the most part, Preston Webb. Um, the invention, the arrangement, and the style, we could say, come from them. But the memory and the delivery, that's all on us. So um, let's get into, uh, let's go into logic here. Logic teaches us to uh, guide our reason discretionally in the general knowledge of things and direct our inquiries after truth. It consists of a regular train of argument, whence we infer, deduce, and conclude according to certain premises laid down, admitted, or granted. And in it are employed the faculties of conceiving, judging, reasoning, and disposing which are naturally led on from one gradation to another till the point in question is finally determined. Preston. So logic is defined as, quote, a science that deals with the principles and criteria of validity of inference and demonstration. It's the science of the formal principles of reasoning, unquote. Um, we already said it came from the Greek logos, meaning simultaneously, meaning reason, idea, word, things like that. Um, I'm sure many of you have sort of meditated on that, on the logos and how, um, how that permeates so many uh, sort of metaphysical uh, domains. Historically, logic has been considered to fall under the broader subjects of philosophy and mathematics. Logic scope, because in both of those, you have you, you know, logic is of course a subset of philosophy, but logic also via Aristotle gave birth to um or mathematics sort of entered into the equation there, equation, um, and uh made reasoning more mathematically logical, formal, formal logic. 
And that begins with Aristotle, who referred to the science as analytics. Aristotle on the left and Andronicus of Rhodes on the right. Um, that biker looking dude on the right. Uh, leader of the peripatetic school at the time. Peripatetic, I think this is cool. You ever been on a hike or something and you're with your uh, friends or your wife or your husband or whatever and you're like, uh, you start to get the most intense, like well-developed we, well uh, thoughts and you're like, God, that is a good idea. You know, like uh, whenever I'm on a hike and, and the blood starts flowing and stuff like that or, or walking or riding the bike, I get the clearest thoughts. But if I'm just sitting there like eating Doritos or something on the couch, it's like, it's like um, psychostasis. Another word I just made up, psychostasis. Um, anyway, so, uh, and I think that's the peripatetics. Here's why I bring that up. The peripatetics uh, means uh, the, 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 the walkers, I guess, or the, I forget what the actual, thing is, but it means to walk or to stroll, peripatetic, um, the strolling philosophers. Um, they compiled Aristotle's six works on logic, which are categories on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and sophistical refutations. They've, they put them into one volume, which you're probably familiar with, called the Organon. It, which means an instrument, a tool, or an organ. Aristotle is credited with the, in, the introduction of the concepts of terms and propositions, as well as the development of the syllogism, which uh, means a, it kind of means a conclusion or an inference. Um, in his prior analytics, he came up with uh, I just made one kind of for the Masonic experience. All Shriners are Masons, right? Um, so that's the major premise. That's the general statement. And then there's a specific statement or, or a minor premise, which is brother AB is a Shriner, right? So then these are combined and they produce a conclusion. And uh, that conclusion is therefore, ergo, Brother A.B. is a Mason. So all Shriners are Masons, right? You could do this in a Venn diagram too, if you have a uh, compasses. You can make a compasses the same way you would make a Wessicopiscus with two uh, circles. You can make a, uh, you can make a uh, syllogism using a compasses, which is pretty, a pretty neat exercise. If you're into that sort of thing. Um, so operations such as the syllogism, um, oh, there we go, yeah. I'm glad I had a slide for this. There's somebody who did it. And there's me taking it off um, the Google and putting it in my thing. Uh, geometrical figures such as the Venn diagram display an obvious concordance with mathematical operations and proofs, proofs like you, know, you learn in uh, Euclid. Uh, the ancients realized this as we find mathematical and geometrical language being applied to problems in the logical domain, as well as the use of logical concepts being used to elucidate problems in mathematics and geometry. Um, so classically, oh, we have to talk about the dialectic real quick. What time is it? I got a couple minutes. The dialectic real quick. Um, so that's, that's uh, generally you hear it expressed as the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis, right? Uh, that's largely, you can call that the Hegelian dialectic. That's um, um, generally what people refer to that as, though Hegel didn't use it. Did you know Hegel, Hegel actually refuted the Hegelian dialectic that bears his own name? Uh, it was a guy named... I don't have it in this presentation and I forget the guy's name, another German who actually came up with that. I can't think of his name. Um, but the two most popular
Uh, works for Brother Jamie. I th it looks like you muted yourself somehow. Um, let's see. How long have I been out? Uh, maybe 10 seconds. Oh, all right, good. Well, look, there's two types of uh, dialectics um, that, well, there's two major types that we talk about regularly. The Hegelian that we just went over. I don't know if you heard all about that, but, uh, but also the, so, the Hegelian dialectic, not Heidegger, Hegel. Um, and, and, oh, and Heidegger didn't come. Oh, if you're saying did Heidegger come? No, it was a guy whose name I'd never heard before, before I was researching this a couple of years ago. It was, I forget the guy's name. If you Google Hegelian dialectic, he's probably in there somewhere, but it was a, a different guy. And Hegel um, uh, refuted it. So he, Hegel came up with actually his own dialectical system, which is not called the Hegelian dialectic. Um, so the Socratic method is the one we're currently dealing with. And there's so Socrates um, underneath a tree with a bunch of younger guys around him, as he was wont to do. And uh, he's hanging out with these guys. And, um, and they, called him, they called him the gadfly. In fact, that's what got him in most of the trouble. I, I think corrupting the youth and uh, being a gadfly to people who thought they knew stuff, um, he bothered them like a gadfly would sting a horse and, you know, and follow it around. Um, and because he was so bothersome and because he was quote unquote corrupting the youth, uh, that's why they made him drink the hemlock and uh, commit suicide. He was, he was suicided. Uh, he was suicided. Okay. Uh, uh, Socrates didn't kill himself. Let's see. So I want a shirt that says that. Maybe I'll sell it to Carl Hearn. Um, so his method, let's get to his method real quick. His method was the Aklenkis. It's a weird sounding name, the Aklenkis. But that was, that was um, continually asking questions to bug the hell out of somebody until they screw up and then you win. Kind of. That's a colloquial way of saying that now. But the, it's not necessarily so, but it is sometimes so. And um, basically, he just asked a bunch of questions, clarifying question after clarifying question until you had to, uh, until you had to see it from his perspective. Now, this is, I wouldn't consider this a sof sophistic dialectic, you know, um, but I would say that th that uh, it's probably not the most honest way of uh, extracting the truth or arriving at the truth. Um, let's do a summary real quick. In summary, so as we have stated, these three subjects comprise the preliminary education which was necessary for the student of the artes liberales, the liberal arts, to move on to the subjects dealt with in the quadrivium. The trivial subjects, and I don't mean trivial as in, you know, oh, what a trifle, you know, like it's just a nothing. Trivial, of course, um, comes from the quadrivial. Uh, the trivial subjects formed the very foundation upon which the student can, could begin to raise their personal temple, a temple supported by wisdom, strength, and beauty. The subjects of the trivium prepared the student to effectively digest literature, to clearly and succinctly record their own thoughts in letters, to compose sound arguments, to deliver persuasive and impactful discourse, to think critically, and to recognize and circumvent logical fallacies in the work of others as well as their own, as well as their own being sort of key, right? Because um, we look at ourselves first, don't we? I mean. Uh, after having become proficient in the trivial subjects, the student was then adequately prepared to move on to the mathematical and physical sciences with which Joe Martinez has mastered. Um, and they comprise the quadrivium, viz, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, after which they can move on to uh, 
the metaphysical subjects of philosophy and theology. And I really like that. A lot of people blow things off after astronomy. You think you're done after astronomy? Like you've made it through the seven liberal arts? It's not the end. That's more preparation. So the trivium prepares you for the quadrivium, which prepares you for the metaphysical arts, right? They Because then you would move on to philosophy next, and then you would go to theology. And philosophy, of course, consists of metaphysics, et cetera. You know, there are um, uh, cosmology, um, cosmogony, eschatology. Uh, you know, there's epistemology, what we can know epistemologically, what can we learn? How do we digest information? So after, after the seven liberal arts and sciences, the quadrivium or the trivium and the quadrivium, you would then move on to the, uh, the metaphysical arts of philosophy and then theology. So um, that's all I got. I really appreciate you guys listening to all that. I know it's some dry stuff, but I try and like, hopefully I try and, you know, I was trying to keep it kind of light and jovial for you um, in these uh, iniquitous times or whatever, you know, like a bunch of crazy, uncertain, ambig ambiguous things happening. We don't know how things are going to land, um, but uh, the end. Thanks, Matt. Jamie, that was fantastic. I uh, really enjoyed that. Picked up a lot of interesting things. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jamie? If you do, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. Come at me, bro. Yeah, really. Anybody, anybody with any questions? Hey, Jamie. Where are you? Who do we got? Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. What's going on? Oh, good. Uh, nothing much. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was excellent. Um, I mean, I had some questions earlier on. I mean, I thought that, you know, your, your question about whether it's art and science, you know, we call it the several liberal arts and sciences, like, you know, which ones are sciences, which ones are arts, or are they all arts and sciences to some degree? Um, I think that's an interesting thing to think about. And, and then also the order of the trivium. Is there an order? Does logic come first and then out of logic comes grammar? And then finally, the embellishment of rhetoric. Um, that was something I was thinking about, but then I had another part of me was thinking, well, maybe rhetoric comes before grammar. But at the end of the day, I felt like that flow from logic to grammar to rhetoric sort of builds. Uh, but just to get your thoughts on that, a little more thoughts on that. Yeah, so... Uh... So I had a discussion actually with Pierce Vaughn about this because the the old uh, order is um, grammar, logic, and then rhetoric, um, or at least or at least in some places you'll see it like that. But we in masonry, of course, have it grammar. Wait, we have grammar. Now I'm forgetting. We have grammar, rhetoric, and logic, don't we? Grammar, logic, rhetoric. No, I look. The How second. am I forgetting? You grammar, were right the first time. Grammar, rhetoric, and logic, right? Yeah. So, okay. so if we have grammar, we, we learn how to uh, uh, form sentences and, and, uh, and sort of uh, write and speak, right? Um, with syntax and morphology, like we talked about. And then grammar, rhetoric. So I don't know. Pierce might be right. And I don't think I really argued the point, but it pro it seems to make more sense if it were to go grammar, logic, then rhetoric. Because if you had logic under your belt and then got into rhetoric, then you would you would be more likely to circumvent logical fallacies, like you know everybody's favorite, the straw man or the the red herring or all of these neat names that we have for these fallacies, the circular argument, uh, the ad hominem. Et cetera, et cetera, the ones that you learn on Facebook in the comments. Um, but uh, so I think if we were to do uh, logic second, that would more naturally lead into rhetoric, which is expressing these ideas idiomatically, right? Because then to dip into the, tr the quadrivium a bit, 
the quadrivium is obviously ordered in that is in that sequence for a reason because you have number you have arithmetic right which is number abstract number uh you have uh which is represented by the point on the top of the tetractus right a, a point having position but no magnitude right and then you have uh arithmetic geometry so you have you have number in space you know so then you get that second tier of the tetractus where there are two points and all of a sudden you have space is created right uh the line uh and then we go into music which is uh number in time um uh, goethe called it that uh um what was his name von snelling called it uh, said the uh, music is uh that architecture is frozen music he said, um, and anybody who's been to a massive cathedral in Europe or even some of them like St. John, St. John the Divine, Upper West Side, that's an amazing uh, cathedral. Um, you know that it's musical. You know that things reverberate in the, and I'm sorry, I'm getting too far into the quadrivium, but uh, to finish it up, we have astronomy, which, which is number in space time. So you have abstract number, number in space, geometry, number in time, music, number in space-time, astronomy. So I would say absolutely the, the trivium and the quadrivium are sequenced for a reason, and I would say that there is a good critique to be made that, that rhetoric and logic should probably be swapped out, or, you know, whatever at this point, but. Mm, I would just follow up and, and say that, I mean, from my own thinking, I mean, since the logic part of it is sort of forming of thoughts, you have to do that first before you're able to, you know, approach grammar or writing or anything like that, or even speaking rhetoric. So, I mean, we think of a child, you know, they have to first start to think and put thoughts together or concepts together in their mind before they start making coherent speech. Um, it just seems so much that it would be the first thing that you should develop. Otherwise you could have people, if they haven't developed logic, then you're writing and talking in, in an illogical, unformed manner. Um, but then again, can you learn logic without the grammar? Well, we speak, grammar, we, we, you know, <laughs> we, we think in words sometimes, right? right. Um, exactly. So, so it's chick, chicken or the egg here. Yeah. And I think that they have to, uh, I, I think that, and words, of course, are concepts. They're behind every word, there is a, a That's right. what, what Plato would call a, a form or an idea, right? Behind every word, there is a form, an archetypal form. Like for instance, when I say fork, uh, you know, you can't point at any one fork and say, this is the quintessential archetypal fork, right? Because it may have three tines, whereas this one may have four tines and it is also a fork. It may be made out of wood, whereas this one is made out of steel. Uh, it, you know, there are any, this one may be massive for picking up steaks out of a barbecue, and this one might be a little tiny one for uh, scooping out the meat from a crab, you know, so it's, uh, but they all share the quality of forkness, and because they have forkness, um, you know, so zeroing back into, you know, does logic precede um, grammar? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows that. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Hey, does anyone else have a have a question for worship brother Jamie? Well, Jamie, I, I tell you what, I thought that was a absolutely fantastic presentation. That's uh, probably one of the best ways I've heard the uh, trivium laid out in the history and uh, basically the logic behind it. I thought it was just absolutely fantastic. So it's really a difficult one. It. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, 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 yeah, you're right. It's, it's a complex topic, and the way you broke it down, I mean, just simplified it to where I think, you know, everyone could really resonate with that. So uh, great job. Thanks. Yeah, I was trying to make it interesting, and I know uh, – if, if you follow any of my, my work or if we're friends on Facebook, you probably know I get into occulty esoteric stuff. And I know I'd rather, um, I'd rather uh, kind of 
be doing that, you know, but, uh, so it's, so it's really challenging for me to, uh, um, take something so dry and try and, uh, make it lively, I suppose. But thanks for, thanks for, uh, the challenge. Thank you. I thought it was lively. It was not dry at all. That was a fantastic presentation. And, um, you know, Joe Martinez and I were kind of chatting offline here and, um, we just love the way you, you kind of riff and, uh, you know, freestyle with, with some of your presentations. I mean, it's just, it's great. Like saying, I'm going to skip this part. It's boring. <laughs> just jumping right into something else. Brilliant. Love it. That, I think that comes from the music. I've, I've been a lifelong musician with a lot of improvisation in my background and you have to kind of play the room, you know? So I, I can't lose that part of me. So it's, uh, it really, um, you know, hopefully I hit, a, I hit some things you guys are interested in. That's all. You absolutely. You absolutely did. And uh, again, we can't thank you enough for being here and, and uh, taking part of your Tuesday out to uh, be with us and, and share that with us. And hopefully we have you back again one day. All right, well. Brothers, friends, um, I appreciate everyone tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, be sure to check out uh, Jamie's books, Ma uh, Myth, Magic, and Masonry, and your new book. Jamie, you want to give it one last plug before it comes out? You're on mute, man. Sorry. Uh, there's the title. So um, look at Pierce did a uh, nice blurb for me. A couple other guys, you know, did some nice blurbs. Oh, you don't get to read it, Jeremy. I saw you start. Um, there we go. You got to wait. But uh, oh, 624. I, I guarantee you'll love it. In fact, let me say this. If you don't love it, give it to somebody else who will. Or um, or uh, or buy one for so somebody else who will. I'll sign it. Um, but it, but I do go through the entirety of the middle chamber lecture, start to finish. Um, I think there was a huge gaping vacuum uh, in our literature there, you know, because I don't know of a book that just goes uh, straight through from the from the esoterically inclined Masonic perspective that goes through the all of those subjects. I'm talking about from the porch, the pillars, the whole set of stairs um, into, the, into the middle chamber and the G and the whole, the whole bit. I go through the entirety of that lecture minutely over the course of literally 452 pages. That's, a, that's like a massive, that's a brick. That's a that's a door holder of a book. A couple of people have asked where they can find the book once it's released. I assume probably Amazon or the usual places. You you can find it on Amazon, but I would recommend going to the publisher, which is the Laudable Pursuit. So I think it's just the laudablepursuit.com. It's easy to find. If you put in the laudable pursuit Freemasonry, you'll, it'll probably pop right up. But they're the ones who put out my last book. They put out P.G. Newman's Alchemically Stoned, which was amazing. If you haven't read that, you need to read it. Um, uh, they they do a great job. They do a quality paperback edition, you know, so it doesn't break the bank. And uh, I would go to them before I'd go to Jeff Bezos. That's for sure. But if you want to go to Amazon, say you got uh, Prime or something like that, then um, then anything you want to do, however you want to get it. Or if you want to email me, you know, uh, hit up one of my pages on Facebook and uh, I'll get you a signed copy. So it comes out 624. Then thanks again. And I'll, I'll leave you guys alone. I know it's getting late there. 
No, Jamie, that's awesome. I just posted the link to the laudable, laudablepursuit.com in the chat so uh, everyone would have that. All right. And with that, uh, again, Jamie, thank you. Awesome. Uh, I look forward to talking to you soon uh, over on Refracted Light. And um, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And we will see you next Tuesday. Thank you, guys. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye, kids. Good night.